I said to one of my colleagues the other day, I imagine at the time, if the captain of the Titanic could go back six hours ahead of time and warn himself, like, hey, this isn't going to work out well, he would have probably adjusted the ship. Well, we have that chance now as Republicans to look and say, we know what's happening. We know how this is going to end. Why would Republicans pick the one person that Joe Biden can beat? That is stupid. Why would they do that? Hi again, everybody. It's 5 o'clock in New York. Well, according to that worldview, looks like the Titanic still very much sank. Here we are. Months later, Donald Trump is officially the nominee of the Republican Party. The man you just heard from is an important figure. He's Wisconsin's assembly speaker. His name's Robin Voss, a Republican, a rare Republican who stood up to Trump in the aftermath of the 2020 election, saying he would not overturn President Joe Biden's victory in his state without any evidence of voter fraud. Voss's clash with Trump earned, earned him fierce criticism and attacks from members of his own party. And just recently, a group of Republicans tried to oust him. They failed. The Milwaukee Journal Sentinel reports that organizers failed to submit enough valid signatures to trigger a recall election. What this shows us, though, is that there are some red lines these days for some, in my view, too few, Republicans. We see it there. In Wisconsin, we saw it in the 2022 midterms when election deniers lost just about every big race in Arizona, Pennsylvania, all over the place. We saw it in the failure of every single anti-abortion law measure referendum that has been put in front of voters, including in very red states, since the Supreme Court overturned Roe. We're seeing that some in the GOP are just not that into this version of the Republican Party, and they're not willing to blindly follow the twice impeached, four times indicted ex-president. Take a listen to this Republican voter in, in Iowa. I've never voted for a Democrat in my life. I had to vote for one last time. I voted for Biden. He's in there, and people like me are going to be the ones that are going to keep Trump out. Sounds like Liz Cheney, right? <laughs> not the Biden part, but keeping Trump out. And it is exactly that kind of voter, those anti-Trump Republican voters, those who under no circumstance will vote for the party's candidate because he's crossed some sort of moral or policy line for them, who are the open question in this election. They could, they might, they mass enough numbers and do what they sound like they're going to do. They have the power to determine the outcome and completely reshape the November election. Take a listen to what a guest on Fox News said yesterday. Nikki Haley won 2.9 million votes in the primary so far. Uh, if those mm -hmm. and our Fox uh, News voter analysis shows that somewhere between five and ten and six and ten of those Nikki Haley voters say they won't vote for Trump in November. If even a fraction of those voters deliver on that promise and stay home or vote third party or just or just you know split their votes or something, Trump loses. He sure does. It's where we start the hour with the founder of Republican Voters Against Trump, the publisher for The Bulwark, Sarah Longwell. She is with us. Also joining us, former chief of staff at the Department of Homeland Security, Miles Taylor, is here, and former RNC chairman, co-host of MSNBC's The Weeknd, my dear friend from another time in Republican politics, Michael Steele, is here. Um, Sarah, I want to start with you, and I, I want to know what your vision is. We've played everything that you have produced of late. It's, it's riveting. It's extraordinary. It's exciting because it feels like the newest thing that we have to chew on, that with the, the numbers, the exit polls for Nikki Haley. What, what do you have planned for the coming days and weeks and months? Yeah, well, look, we launched a $50 million campaign uh, to defeat Trump. We call it Republican Voters Against Trump. And we ran this campaign back in 2020. We also ran a version of it in 2022. We had Republican voters against Kerry Lake, Republican voters against Herschel Walker, um, and a number of the anti-democratic candidates that were running then. The difference between what we're doing now in 2024 is that all of the testimonials that we've amassed from these voters are people who voted for Donald Trump and are not going to do it again. And what we know from our research is that you have to create a permission structure for reluctant Republicans, sort of soft GOP voters, right-leaning independents, who don't identify as Democrats, who oftentimes disagree with Democrats on policy, um, but you sort of have to give them a tribe, a place to belong, to say, look, I, it's tough for me to vote for a Democrat, but I'm going to do it because I cannot stand Donald Trump. I think he's bad for the country. And by bringing those voices out, by showing them to sort of 
these potentially persuadable margins. And I think the margin is real. You know, there's a number I'm obsessed with, and it's 30 percent. You see it all over the place. If you ask Republicans, how many of you think that the 2020 election was stolen? About 70 percent say yes, about 30 percent say no. If you ask uh, Republicans, uh, will you vote for Donald Trump if he's convicted of a crime? About 30 percent say no. And Nikki Haley's margins among self-ID'd Republicans in places like South Carolina and New Hampshire, and then uh, again in Michigan, they were all around 27, 28 percent. Look, some of those people are going to vote for Donald Trump. Some of those people already are voters for Joe Biden. But some of them are the critical people that need to be persuaded this time around. And they, they we call them sort of double doubters or double haters or a pox on both their housers. They don't really like either candidate. But when push comes to shove, they often dislike Donald Trump more. And we want to help build and cultivate a permission structure and a micro tribe for those people to be able to ultimately vote for Joe Biden. Is it, Sarah, like a, a play in three acts? I mean, would, 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 I mean, I interviewed the, the, the gentleman in Oklahoma who wrote the op-ed in, in, in his local paper about his journey, and, he, and he's arrived at this point you're talking about where he will not vote for Donald Trump under any circumstances. But I wonder how you move them to take the affirmative step of going out on election day or getting an absentee ballot and voting for Joe Biden. How, what does the conversion campaign look like to turn them into Biden voters? You know, this is something that Donald Trump usually does for us. Um, because Donald <laughs> Trump, and, and this, is, this is actually, um, right now, you know, I think Joe Biden is the president. And so he is very much top of mind for people. And the fact is a lot of voters have forgotten how much they dislike Donald Trump. But I've been doing focus groups almost every week for the past three cycles. And if there's one thing I've seen as you get closer to these elections, both in 2020 and in 2022, these voters, when it push comes to shove, these extreme candidates, and when it comes to Donald Trump, they just say, and, and you know, our most persuasive videos are the ones where the voters sort of put their heads, their heads in their hands and they say, I'm going to do it. I'm going to vote for a Democrat because I cannot stand this guy. He's bad for the country. I cannot see him be president again. Um, the other thing that I think is so interesting is all the losing. I mean, I think, Michael Steele, that, that, that I, it broke my heart when people that I'd known stayed with Trump after the Access Hollywood tape came out because I thought that I knew something about the character of the party that I had served and that it wouldn't vote for someone who bragged about grabbing women between the legs, and they did. And then I thought that the party I worked for wouldn't stay with someone who was clearly um, sharing a mission and an affinity for everything Putin did and stood for, but they did. And I thought that I was in a party that would break with him after he saw good people on both sides of a KKK rally, in which a woman died, but they did. But the thing that really shocks me is that he's such a loser, and they're still with him. Yeah, maybe because they're losers, too. I don't know. Um, they haven't won much. Um, and I think that's part of the soup, that they're all collectively in together. Which is why they why they seem to coagulate the way they do. I mean, look, give me more Sarah Longwell. I mean, she's out there doing the laying down and doing the foundational work that's going to be important for this election. Talking to real live voters who are giving us an inclination of of their thinking. The challenge we have, and 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 it's an essential one in my view. Uh, particularly when it comes to those Republicans that we've been talking about, who, unlike me, go, you know what, my country matters more to me than any party at any time, any place, anywhere. They still hold on to that political uh, strap, if you will, that ties them, binds them, either through legacy or family or just experience to the Republican Party. And they don't see themselves voting for a Democrat. Not that Joe Biden's a bad guy, and yeah, they may disagree with some of the spots, just because he's a Democrat, and I just don't vote for Democrats. And so the question is, how do you crack that nut? How do you begin to peel that back in a way that gives those, and, and Sarah put the right term in, in play, the permission. It's okay, boo. You can vote for, you can vote for Biden. It's all right. The world will be better tomorrow. You, you know, you'll get to pay your mortgage next week and, and the kids will go to school in the fall. I mean, the world doesn't change if you actually focus on and, and put in play 
the country, because at the end of the day, that's what it's all about. So setting up this, this uh, narrative for them, I think, breaks along the lines of the extremist behavior of the party that they still feel a, an affiliation for versus the, the opportunity to acknowledge the freedom of every citizen in this country, the freedom to assembly, the freedom to make choices over their health and their education and their families, the freedom to uh, be a part of the global community. Weighing that argument for, for these voters, I think, becomes an essential part of the, the conversation going forward, which gets me back to how I started this, Nicole, the work that Sarah's doing, the effort that's behind that work is going to be important because it will tap into those voters in a way that levels up the messaging, um, which is going to be so important because they can't let go of the thing they actually need to let go of. And so we got to help, help them do that.